in wherever you are. It's also an opportunity again for me to be here this uh this day. I've always enjoyed any time I'm here to present and I do not take it for granted. And to the familiar faces I see here in the house, uh, I say thank you again for having me. I see a lot of my guests in the house. So I'm honored again to take this class. So what are we talking about this evening? So this evening we're going to be talking about what I call an elephant in the room. A lot of people want to know that I, I have this product in Nigeria. I want to take it to the US. What do I need to do to take it to the US? So if that is your question, you are in the right spot. So over the next 50 minutes, uh, yes, I'll be walking you through. If you have a product that you are making in Nigeria and you want to take it to the US market, what do you need to do? So follow me and I, and I will explain that to you in the next 50 minutes. So what is the uh, essence of this class? What's the audience? The essence is simply that if you've got a product you make in Nigeria and you're looking to take that product to the US, we have what we call the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, which is for importers of human and animal food to the US. And I'm gonna walk you through how can you make your product available to the US from Nigeria. So that's what we're gonna be discussing in the next 50 minutes. I'm sure by now, most of us will have seen something like this, where Nigerian products have been one time or the other rejected by foreign income, foreign uh, nationals for different things. We've heard from the UK to the EU, to the US, yeah, to Canada, to China, different Nigerian products going across the globe mm -hmm. and being rejected for several things. So why? Basically because they are not meeting regulations, meeting specifications, or meeting what we call standards. So, uh, in this quick presentation, I'll be presenting to you an overview of what do you need to do to make sure that whatever product you have can meet the U.S. regulation. Let's take a look at this stat graph. This shows in cubic metric tons mm -hmm. the quantity of product being imported into the U.S. every year you can tell that the number is growing and is astronomical, which means if you got a product and it meets regulation and it meets standard, the US is where you need to send it. Let me rephrase. If you've got excess of products in Nigeria that you think you want to ship, you want to export, and you're looking for which countries, will, which country, will meet the best financial return for you. It's the US. Look at this number, it's growing. You can tell between 2012 and 2022, the volume over doubled, 100% increase in the amount of food going into the US. So, and you can tell when you look at the, the value of foreign exchange right now. So if you're looking into exports, the US is one of the few places you want to consider. And I tried to look at the number of the top 10 countries shipping products into the US and where the US is going. It saddens my heart to understand that no African country is in the fourth ten of both spectrums. Considering the amount of arable lands we have for farming and food processing in Africa, no African country is in the top 10 of both spectrums of import and export of food into and out of the US. And if you look at how much food we grow, there's the opportunity. So right now, our job as food scientists now begins to look at where we have food wastage and food spoilage and all this raw material wastage. What other product can we start harnessing and getting into the United States? So where does import and export of food start from? Codex already gave us the four pillars that you need for import and export of food. Codex already tells us that to meet the requirement of human health measures, there has to be transparency. There has to be equivalence. It has to be scientific. And it has to be, there has to be that harmonization. So in this presentation, I'm gonna tell you how the US has adopted these codex guidelines to meet the US regulations and what the United States has to do to admit products into their country. Basically, 
the U.S. has these big buckets of things that needed to be done for you to bring product into the U.S. And so in this presentation, I'm going to go through each one of these buckets as the main pilots or the main pivots or the main support of whatever you need to do to bring product into the U.S. You start from your food facility registration to the labeling compliance, to the production safety, to strict food safety regulations, template for food safety plans, the choice of a US-based agent, fulfilling the needs of a foreign supplier verification program, talking about the voluntary qualified importer program and the accredited third party certification program. So for you to meet requirement to bring food product into the United States, this is what you need to do. And so what does this mean? I'm gonna take it one point at a time and I'll explain what each one of them means and what you have to do to meet them. And this is what qualifies you theoretically to bring product inside the US. So let's look at it. What are the most important types of food into the US market? Top on the list is animal products, your meat, your poultry, whatever it is, fish and shellfish, dairy products, vegetables. Then we've got fruits and juices, nuts, coffee, tea, spices, herbs, grains, legumes, oils, candy and sugar products, cocoa and chocolate products, beverages, and for the life of it, liquor. So these are the top types of foods being imported into the U.S. So if you've got any product category, uh, type that falls into any of this category, then you qualify to bring those products into the U.S. if you fulfill all those requirements. Let's take a look at problems with imported food into the U.S. Between 2013 and 2017, cilantro from Mexico coming into the U.S. had several import land for food safety violations. Pet food from China coming to the U.S. had melamine, papaya, what we call purple. From Mexico had salmonella in 2011 and 2017. Strawberries from Egypt had hepatitis A, and it handed them a recall. And various fruits from, uh, from Japan uh, were victims of uh, radionuclide uh, contamination in 2011. So if you look at this, Bringing food into the U.S. that doesn't make re uh, requirement puts you in a bad light. It puts you in a bad omen. So you have to look for how do you meet regulations? What do you need to do to ensure that whatever product you bring into the U.S. is safe, wholesome, edible for both human and animal consumption? So step one, to import food into the U.S., you need to be registered. So there is this false account, we'll call it, or the FFR, which you call the food facility registration. So either you're a facility in the U.S. or out of the U.S., no matter where you are situated, if you produce food and the food is being sold in the U.S. market, you have to register so that the U.S. knows where you are. And so this is the online uh, account that you have to register. You put all your information into it and it registers you. It's a free website. You don't have to pay a dime. Although some people use agents, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but you can do this by yourself, that if you make food that you intend to bring into the market, uh, the, into the United States market for sale or for, uh, for commerce, both for human and animal consumption, then you have to register. So that is the number one thing. And this is this false or uh, FFR account that you have to follow to register yourself. It's a free uh, online account, but you just have to put your information in it to register the facility. So this is where the facility is, our uh, information online. You go there, enter your particulars, enter your information, fill it as possible, as correct as possible, do it. One important thing you need to know is that when you're doing the registration, you have to ensure that the kind of product you intend to bring into the U.S. is covered in here. So you have, there is a drop-down button here. Go to that drop-down button and be sure that whatever food you're bringing into the U.S. is uh, listed here and it's uh, checked. Very essential that when you do this registration, 
there are two important numbers that you have to get. The first one is the unique facility identifier, UFI, or the FFR number, whatever it is called, or the, uh, oh, sorry, and the DUNS number. The DUNS number is what clears you for your clearance. The first, the unique uh, facility identifier is what uh, number you get from your for food safety and quality uh, processes, and your DUNS number is for the customs and import uh, number. So just like you have your BVN and your NIN, the same thing almost similar is what you have here. You need your unique facility identifier and the DUNS number. If you don't have those two numbers, you will never get product into the US soil. So when you do your registration, and these slides are gonna be shared for you, you will see those websites here, that you can get to uh, register yourself and get these two numbers. They're very, very important for you to have. They serve like your uh, BVN or NIN or, or as the case maybe, but having this number is very, very important. Then number two, you have to follow the US labeling requirements so that your product is not misbranded. I have full survey of over two, two years worth of data from the FDA of why products are being rejected uh, from outside of the country. And after adultery, uh, between adulteration and misbranding, you could tell that they run the top two reasons why foods are being rejected at the border coming into the US. Because the way you branded your product does not meet the US regulation. So for you to be able to sell your product, either in retail or in uh, bulk, whichever way, the labeling has to confirm with the US labeling requirement. So labeling is required for most prepared food, processed food, packaged foods. And this includes the way you do your nutrition facts panel. Different countries have the way they do their nutrition fact panel. But if you're bringing any product to be sold in the United States, your nutrition fact panel has to conform to the US uh, fact panel. And it must be accurate, it must be truthful, and it must be in English, except if that product is going to be sold in some US territory where Spanish is the language, uh, such as Puerto Rico. So your product has to conform with language requirement and meet language eligibility. Then your declaration, uh, your uh, ingredient deck and packaging must meet the standard of identity for what the US requires. No matter where it is, where you're coming from, the way coming to the US, if that product is coming to the US, your declaration and your ingredient deck must meet the US regulation. It must be exactly as the way the US wants it. Then if you are making health or nutritional claims for products you are bringing to the US, low sugar, reduced fat, zero, zero sugar, reduced sodium, uh, for high source of calorie, uh, reduced source of calorie, high source of protein, all those nutrition claims, you have to have scientific validation that proves that you those claims are accurate and you can make those uh, claims. So whatever types of claims or health claims you're making on that product, reduced sugar, low calorie source, zero sugar, no added sugar, zero salt, 20% less sodium, whatever claim you're making, it must be truthful and you must have scientific validation to support it that truly that product is uh, fulfills the claim you are making of it. Also, if your product has any allergy uh, claims, it must conform. And this is another tricky one, that allergies list varies from country to the countries. In US, we used to have the big eight, now we have the big nine. Mm -hmm. In Canada, they've got the big 10. Uh, in uh, the UK, they've got the big 10, depending on where sulfite or sesame or mustard falls around those countries. What if you're bringing your product into the US, your allergen declaration must meet those of the big nine that we have here. So if you're coming from anywhere where you have 10, 20 allergens, that's okay. But your allergen declaration on the labeling must conform to the U.S. requirements. However, there are some exceptions for small business owners that are making ingredients. And I'm going to come to that in a minute too. But let's put that in the parking lot. If you are a small business owner 
and you're shipping product into the US in bulk, a little quantity for further processing or what we call ready to cook, then your leveling the requirement is a little different. And I'll get that to that in a minute. But number one, we said you have to register and I've explained how to register. Then secondly, your leveling, either bulk, individual, retail, whatever it must make those that currently exist in the United States. What are some basic characteristics of labeling that you require? The US law require three primary panels. We have what we call the PDP, not the PDP we talk, we know, but we call it the principal display panel and the information panel and the nutrition fact panels. Those uh, P, uh, panels must compare to what is in the US. Then on your PDP, the name must sound and be synonymous for what is the standard of identity for that pro uh, uh, product and must be both in imperial US and metric term, in uh, metric, uh, sorry, numbers. So understand that the US is a metric and uh, imperial. So when you bring in product into the US, you need to take cognizance of this labeling requirement and how the ingredient must be listed in order of predominance from highest to least. So when you're labeling it and declaring your ingredient, uh, on your deck, it must be from other predominance and must include all sub ingredients. In some countries, like in the EU, uh, some part of Asia, if you use processing eggs, they may or may not be added. Here in the US, they must be included. So if you, if you include processing eggs and things like that, they must be included in your PD, uh, on your IP. So that's important. Then you should have your manufacturer's address, your street, your state, your country, and things like that. And like, again, like I said, your allergen declaration must follow the big H declaration. So your leveling compliance becomes another critical element of you getting your product to be sold into the United States. Then number three, you need to understand the FDA requirement for your product safety. There are various food safety requirements all over the world. Different countries have their different expectations, but in the United States, for your product to be admissible mm. into commerce here, it must meet the FDA requirement for food safety. So you must follow your food safety tools, your prerequisite programs. Your product must state uh, expressly, expressly if it is ready to eat, if it is ready to cook, if it is for further processing. Your product must meet the criteria of safety of all those products. If your product is a ready to eat product, you must have documentation to show your kill step validation. What lethality, method of lethality did you use to control microbial hazards? If what is the assurance of commercial sterility if that product is ready to eat? And you must show evidence of meeting current good manufacturing practices in your facility. So if you're bringing in a product from anywhere into the US, the expectation is that if you're making it in Ghana or Congo or, Congo or Zimbabwe, that facility must meet the same requirements as a facility in Atlanta or in New York or in Baltimore and Maryland. So you need to understand the requirements that is peculiar to that product that allows you to make it in Ghana or in Nigeria and be able to export it into the US. So you need to also understand some key element of regulations of food safety. Number one, like I said, it's the current uh, good manufacturing practices that you have good GMPs in place and your standards of growing, harvesting, packaging, producing, whatever it is, are equivalent to those that are applicable into the US. Then you need to also understand that there are some specific regulations for some high-risk products. The U.S. has some extra stringent, and I use the word cautiously, stringent regulation for some foods coming into the U.S. So if you are making that product outside of the U.S. and bringing same into the U.S., you must abide by those regulations. And we have some of them to include the preventive controls for human food, the preventive controls for animal food, the Food Safety Modernization Act, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. 
you need to research the individual regulations of these products and be sure that whatever product you are making falls into those category. Again, there are some, also some high-risk products that the U.S. has specific regulations for. If you're making acidified or low-acid canned food, 21 CFR 121, know and understand it and meet that regulation. If you are making uh, thermally processed foods uh, stored in thermatic seals, you need to find out that regulation and be sure that your product makes it. If you're bringing juice into the U.S., U.S. has a separate juice hazard requirement that you have to meet. If you bring in seafood into the U.S., U.S. has a separate seafood uh, food safety program that you have to follow. If you have bringing meat and meat uh, uh, poultry product into the U.S., 21 CFR 407, 409, you need to follow those regulations and be able to bring it. If you bring in share fields into the U.S., 21 CFR 118, you need to be able to follow those regulations. If you bring in infant formulas or, uh, or what we call baby food in Nigeria into the U.S., there are special regulations that you have to follow. If you're bringing in bottled water into the US, you have to follow this regulation. So it's very, very important that you follow these regulations that if your food is into any of these high risks, you go and research them and make sure that they follow these regulations. Also, your facility must operate under a food safety plan. And you must have a verified, validated, reassessed, and audited food safety plan. So, and here in the US, we have two templates for food safety plans. We've got the general conventional HACCP program as designed by Codex Alimentarius. However, a few years ago in the United States, another food safety template was, uh, was developed, which we now call the HAPC. I would call it the Hazard Analysis Risk-Based Prevention Control Food Safety Plan System. You must have a food safety plan system that incorporates both. What I've seen is that we have templates out there in the open that combines the two of them together. But you have, if you are bringing in a F, an FDA-regulated product inside the US, you must have a food safety plan. And the food safety plan must cover both elements of the HACCP and HACCP system. You must have carried out a hazard uh, risk assessment of your facility and the hazard analysis of your ingredients and raw materials. So these are critical elements of food safety that if you need to bring product into the US, you have to, you must follow them. Then in some cases, I have seen in companies or individuals use a US-based agent for food imports. There are a few of them out there. A quick Google search will show you some of them. And why do you need them? Sometimes you need them because it makes clearing of customs if efficient. It boosts your customs and trade compliance. It helps you to navigate the custom exigencies or exuberances that may occur. It helps you to build efficient import process. And in some cases, there are some trade agreements or alliances of financial incentives that you might enjoy. And it helps you to maintain uh, supply chain visibility. So most of the time, I've seen companies or individuals who've got products outside wanting to bring it into the US to use a US-based agent. That is somebody who is based in the US that acts like an intermediary or act like a precursor between the US market uh, buyers and you making it uh, in the foreign location. But, uh, but it's very advisable sometimes that you use uh, a US-based agent to help you. So I'm having questions. So I think I can take uh, some questions. Yes. Uh, somebody said, So is there a facility that helps with these researches? I mean, how do I get an accurate guide and exactly all I ought to know if I need to? So this is what I'm doing right now. I'm just trying to give me one minute. I'll get to you, sir. Is that there are some US-based agents that you can help. So all you need to do is just to type in US agent for food import and you get some good company. But I'm just giving you an overview this evening of what are the things you need to know 
And what are the things you need to take cognizant of? And like I said earlier in the beginning, here, that the big buckets of stuffs of what you need to know is this. This is just the major building blocks of what you need to put into consideration. But this list is inexhaustible. But you have to, you can, in some cases, get an agent who will walk through it. But these are the basics of what you need to do. Mr. Inosa. Um, a very good evening to you, Dr. Dubebi from Lagos, Nigeria. And as, as always, I want to say a big uh, thank you for always giving us uh, insights and um, and helping us to navigate contemporary issues in the food industry. This particular topic, like you said, is a big elephant in the room. And I think most people here are really uh, fascinated with the insights that you have given. So well done to you, uh, Dr. Udubebi. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you, All right. Uh, I want to just land on one question, one or two questions. One is um, you've said so much about um, regulations and requirements that is needed to uh, to import food into the U.S. Now, the question I'm asking is, uh, where is where is the place of equivalence in this? Because I believe that if um, I've gone through all the regulations in Nigeria, gone through uh, NAFDA gone through uh, plants, uh, uh, Nigeria cultural quarantine and all that. There are still a whole lot of things you need to do even in Nigeria before you can export. So what I'm what I'm saying is, uh, is, is it that those things will not really count in the U.S. market? If you have uh, sound uh, regulation uh, requirements here in Nigeria, should that not uh, give you some sort of uh, leverage? Or better still, what we call um, uh, regulatory arbitrage. Can you not at least enjoy some sort of regulatory arbitrage? That's uh, that's one. Then on the second question, I wanted to ask is um, is the use of uh, agents? Yes, use of agents will it um, in any way give you some? Um, okay, I wanted to understand very clearly what uh, leverage, what advantages you can enjoy. Is it that there's going to be some sort of waivers? in the regulations or how does the agent thing come in? So uh, thank you. Um, back to you, Dr. Dubu. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. Good questions. And I'll answer both of them. If you look at the chart I have up here, and this is the chart from Codex, and I call it the four pillars of import and export as defined by, uh, by Codex. Codex clearly says that the four pillars of import and export includes transparency equivalence, science-based measures, uh, measures or harmonization. But unfortunately, codex also give individual countries the ability to arbitrarily decide what they want on themselves. Like I said earlier on, HACCP is the global language of food safety. That's what is applicable all over. However, a few years ago, the United States, about 10, 12 years ago, the United States said, you know what? We no longer believe in HACCP. We will go have C. They are free to do that. Canada said, you know what? I want to go the preventive controls rule. Canada did that. The UK said we won't have a food safety standard. They did that. So in some cases, some countries would say, you know what? Based on our own unique nature of our food system that we want to adopt, this is what we want to do. And if you want to do business with us, you have to abide with me. I always like to use this analogy in cases like this. When I have a daughter, I call my daughter whatever I, I, name I want. And if you want to respect me, you call my daughter, you call me Baba, whatever. That is my daughter's name. You call by something else, I'm not going to answer. So it's the same way in a case like this, that there's equivalence for each other country, each individual country also has the prerogative. They have the right to, call, to do an addendum or whatever they want to. They could ban any country. No, they beat it. You call your daughter whatever name you want to call it, same way. So you just have, you are the one that wants to do business with them. And you are the one that has to meet their requirement. But what I know is that the requirement has spelled out. The requirement are there. If you follow it the way it's supposed to be followed, trust me, you shouldn't have much problem. And I say this carefully, most of the time or some of the time or partially part of the time, whatever terminology or adjective I can, 
The reason we get into these cases is that some countries want to shortchange themselves. We want to maximize our profits and we are not thorough, we are not diligent in what we are trying to do. We do not mm. follow the requirements and specifications to the letter. Then when we are caught, we crowd foul of what is happening. So my expectation is that we begin to study whatever product we want to ship or export from Nigeria to the US. Begin to look at the export requirements for those products. Begin to understand, is this product in any of the high risk categories? Is there any extra uh, registration, any extra requirement that I need to do? Begin to look at the labeling. Do I need to create a label for import and a label for export? Several years ago, I used to work in a company where we make meat products and about 50% of our products were exported. And we have labels for different countries. So when we're going to Japan, we say this is Japan label. When we're going to China, say this is China label. When we're going to India, say this is India label. So you have to start looking at things like that. If I'm making a product and a product is going to do it to the US, then I'm going to create a US specific label that makes, that makes it. A few days ago, I was at ShopRite in Ikeja. Just a few days ago, I picked up a yogurt product and the labeling was all in Arabic. And I couldn't read it. And my thing was that if I'm allergic to dairy and I don't know, and I think it is juice, how warning, what kind of warning do I get if the label is in Arabic? I mean, this was just a few days ago. The label was a yogurt product at the shop right in the kitchen, and it was all written in Arabic. No word of English on that. And what kind of, what kind of warning do you give to if it's got an allergic uh, ingredient to do? So begin to understand that if I'm going to ship into the US, then I have to meet their label requirements. So it's about understanding where the part of equivalence is, is that yes, equivalence is a pivot, is a pillar, is a support that we have to, to meet. However, I also have to need to go beyond and above to convince them that the product I make in Nigeria is equivalent to what you will accept. Then talking about agents, why do you need agents sometimes? These agents are essential because they help you navigate the stormy waters of import. This is what they do for a living. So they can help you to tell that, hey, the product you want to bring, eh, this is how much you might make, this is how much you might not make. Eh, the product you are making is not a high valued or high traffic product. Or the product you are making, there are some non-value added tasks you're doing or you go back and do more. So they help us support to help you. And like I said, they know where some trade agreements or some waivers or some product category financial incentives lies or what you can do to better enhance that product. So that is why sometimes those kind of agents are encouraged to, uh, to be used to help you uh, through this process. How long in most cases does it take to complete this requirement when it is started? Knowing how long back home it takes with our home regulatory organization, let's talk about the expenses. It varies. I can't stand here and tell you a month or two or three, but I can tell you uh, uh, a broad figure that it's not too long. To complete all these products, all these processes, your registration can be done in a day or two to get the UFI, to get the dumps number. It's not a long process. You do it within a day or two, you get it. Then if you have your labels, understanding the level requirements, it's not too hard. Researching the regulations around the product you are making shouldn't be too hard. So, so you should be able to do this and get the product on the shores within a, a short period. So, uh, I mean, to the processing of food stuff, cassava, fufu, yeah, yeah, sweet spices, yes. You can get them here, you can export them. As long as they meet the requirements that we're talking about, then it is. The American registration is free. However, you might pay some taxes and some customs fee and everything, but to actually register your product, it's online. It will tell you to upload your registration, upload your label, upload this, upload that. Somebody gets it at the other hand, reviews it, make sure it's mixed and that. You get your false number within days. It's free. It's your process of shipping the product to the shores of the country that will take money. So if you look at here, where I, uh, I uh, put in some snapshots of how to do this, this is how to do your registration. It's absolutely free. You don't pay a dime. 
Just put in the names of the owners, your emails of the owners of your purchase, uh, your food safety plan. You will upload it, uh, your uh, product description page, your product specification sheet, all those informations, upload it up there. Somebody gets it at the other side. Their job is to review it. If it doesn't meet, they'll send it back to you to, on what to amend. If it meets anything, you get your dunce number, you get your UFI number, and you're done. So it's conceptually very simple. So you don't pay. Is it true that some products don't need NAVDAC registration for importation into that? I do not know. But what I know is that if you bring any product into the US, the food has to meet the US standard and it has to be registered with us. So I'm not in Nigeria, so I do not know if the product needs NAVDAC registration to be shipped or not. But what I know for certain is that when it's coming, it has to. Can you register on the FFR portal from Nigeria? Yes, the portal is open. You, a quick Google search will give you the false home. And I've, I cleared the email here, the address here. You will see just food facility, FDA, FFR food facility registration. Just Google it, you will see it. And it's gonna give you a page like this and you can register anywhere from around the world. So let's continue. We have. I only have 50, uh, uh, 10 more minutes. So, so who is the foreign supplier? A foreign supplier means the manufacturer, the processor, any food, animal product, or anything outside of the US wanting to bring such product uh, into the US. That is a foreign supplier. So if you're making a product outside of the shores of the United States and you're willing to bring the product into the US, mm -hmm. then you need, you are a foreign supplier. So what is an FSVP? FSVP is what we call the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. And this is a program in the US where all records and document documentation that demonstrate your compliance with applicable FNG requirements for a particular imported food products by a foreign supplier is performed. So you as a foreign supplier of bean cake flour in Nigeria, you're shipping it into the US. You have to meet the requirement of the FSVP. And that is the lengthy documentation process. And what that does for you is it helps you to show that equivalence that you've done everything you need supposed to do and your product is fit and worthy to be shipped into the US. So the FSVP is that platform, that program that you have to follow to ensure that your product meets the US commerce. So what is the, what's the purpose? The purpose is just that equivalence that we talk about. And number two, to ensure public health, that you are not bringing a product that is going to kill everybody here. So the FSVP is that system where it helps the equivalence that we talked about, the public health, and ensure that the product is not adulterated or misbranded uh, coming into the U.S. So who is an importer? An importer just means the U.S. owner or now a consignee. Remember, the first terminology we looked at is what we call a foreign supplier. Now, we also now have another term that we call the importer. And let me now make a clarification of the two. You making a product in Nigeria, you're a foreign supplier because you are making it. However, if you make that product, Mr. Aino, let me use as an example, in the corners of your house, you make a juice product, you're a foreign supplier. But me, I'm here in the US, I now come to you I buy all of the product from you in 100% and I bring it to the US, then I am the importer, you are the foreign supplier. And in those cases, those agents I showed you the other time, I explained the other time, they are most of the time the importers. So in some cases, you can be the foreign supplier, 
that manufactures or co packs or packs or whatever process the food in Nigeria. You sell it to an importer and he goes, takes the product away from there. Then he becomes the importer. He gets to be the one to deal with all the FSDP and documentation things. So note that there's a difference between the term, the foreign supplier, or the importer. And in most cases, the importer is the US owner or the consignee or the person who is responsible for that product when it gets to the US soil. Let's look at a couple of examples to drive this home. A US company buys salsa from various foreign suppliers, originally for shipment into the US, and then offsells the salsa product to small retailers. Because it's a US company is the owner of concerning of the salsa when it arrives, it is in the FHCP importer. So let me explain this. I am ABC Food. I am, I, I am selling salsa in the US. Salsa is that uh, fruit and vegetable medley they put together to eat as a snack food. And I'm not making it here. I'm making it in Africa. So I make some in Nigeria. I make some in Ghana. I make some in Togo. I put everything together and I bring it into the US. Those people I'm buying it from, they are the foreign supplier. But me that I'm bringing it into the US, I am the importer. So I get to do the documentation. So most of the time, it's always very, uh, I've seen a lot of people do this, that they are just the foreign supplier and they hand off the product to an importer or a co-signee uh, as the case may be. Uh, another example, a US salsa again, processor signs a contract and submit purchase orders to a foreign salsa ingredient supplier for the ingredient to be used in its salsa making facility, but relies on foreign export company to make the arrangement for transportation and entry in the US. Also, this salsa processor doesn't pay for the salsa ingredient until they are delivered. Because the US processor has agreed in writing to purchase the ingredient, it meets the definition of an importer. So let me explain this. I am making salsa in Nigeria, but I'm bringing it to the US. But Mr. B in the US has agreed that if you bring it here and you get it in my hand, I will buy everything for you. Just bring it here. In this case, you as the processor, you have to be the processor, the foreign supplier, and the importer. So because your company, the other company here in the US, is only buying finished products from you, they don't want to do with the documentation and all those things, the processes. So in this second case, I am making it in Nigeria. I'm bringing it to the US. So I have to be the importer, the foreign supplier, and everything. I'm only selling finished products to that guy. So I'm giving you this scenario so that you know that whatever products you are trying to make, what category do you want to put it? Do you want to put it in a category where you are just the foreign supplier and you're looking for somebody that's going to come and take it and go run with it? Or you want to be both, where you are both the foreign supplier and also the importer? Let's look at a couple more. A Canadian company ships a food product to Montana in the US in the anticipation of possible orders from customers. There is no person in the US that owns or has agreed to purchase that food and it's still owned by the Canadian firm. The US uh, importer will have to be properly designate a US agent or representative. There. So in this case, I am making products in Canada and I'm shipping it in the US. I don't have buyer yet. I don't have anybody who is wanting to take that product for me. So in this case, it's recommended that you get an agent that is going to stand in for you where you can ship that product to and they will hold it for you, do all your documentation for you. We've looked at three scenarios. Let me explain the three scenarios. In the, again, in the first one, I'm just a foreign supplier. I'm making it in Lagos and I'm selling it to somebody who's taking it. Bye-bye. In the second one, I am making it and I'm shipping it to somebody who has agreed to buy it from me, everything. But in this third one, I don't have a buyer yet. I'm just making it in faith and anticipation that when it gets there, I'm going to find a buyer. It is recommended that I get an agent who is going to help you to look for that market. Then lastly, a US retailer contracts the foreign manufacturer to produce products that have the retailer's name. The retailer actually purchased the product from the US firm after the product have entered the US. 
if other firms own the product when offered for uh for entry, they are the FSVP importer. So I'm making a proprietary product for let me call it ABC food here. And I'm making it in Lagos. And right in Lagos, I already put ABC food into the US. In this particular case, almost similar to the second one, the ABC food in the US owns that product because they are the one coming to Lagos to take it in bulk to the US. So foreign supplier exists in these four main buckets. So it is left for you to understand that if I want to ship products, which of these four scenarios would I put my products? Do I just want to be a foreign supplier? Or do I want to be a foreign supplier and an importer? Or do I want to get an agent? Or do I want to have a company that will just come and get everything? So based on these four categories, you can understand and find out where and how do you want to do your business and upgrade. As I begin, I only have five more minutes. As I begin to round down, what are some standard requirements for foreign supplier program? You need to conduct your, your hazard analysis. And this will include both your products, your processes, your equipment, and everything. You must have the evaluation of your foreign facility food safety performance. There must be an auditing. Then if you have uh, foreign suppliers too, that, that if you're making juice in Nigeria, but the main orange is coming from somewhere else. There must be an acceptance, a system that will let you know that the oranges are also bringing is also acceptable. There, there must be a written food safety program, like I talk about. Then your verification activities must be there. Identify who the FSUP importer is and your records. Like we've always said, if you don't have records, it did not happen. Then there is now an added program that you can do that can help your foreign supplier program. We call this the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program. What is this? This is a special program where me, as a manufacturer of products in Nigeria, I will go to the FDA and I said, I want to declare everything about me to you. This is all I do. Then they would conduct a thorough analysis that can include an audit or whatever. But what that does to you is that it helps you put you in charge. It's like your global entry card. That for those that have global entry cards all over the world, you just walk through the line because you're a known traveler. The same thing is for the voluntary qualified importer program. That anytime you bring your product, they just tell go, 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 go. We already know you're a good person. It's like when you know the bank manager at the bank, and anytime you know people are identify, say, ah, you come, you come, you come, you are a big customer. It's something like this that you go to the uh, VQIP and it puts you in front of the line. Then there's also one last thing you need to do. It's called the accredited third party certification. In some cases, you can, uh, you can obtain some third party certifications that also put you in front of the line. So if you have a CFSI scheme, your FSSC, your BRC, your SQF, your uh, uh, Canada GAP, your Global GAP, your uh, uh, FSC, if you your ISO, if you've got a foreign uh, third party accredited program that is acceptable to the FDA, they can accept that in lieu of all those food safety programs and put you in front of the line as acceptable for, for foreign supply verification. So what are some advantages of, of, of these third party certifications? Is that it helps you and prepare you to achieve the VQIP number one, and it gives you that good standing as as I suffer. Then what happens? When you go all through this, be prepared. What are you going to be prepared for? One day, the FDA may show up at your door, either announced or unannounced, because now they have all your information. Now they know where you are. Now they know what you do. So be prepared for a foreign food facility inspection program. They will just knock on your door one day, either announced or unannounced, to conduct a thorough audit of your facility to be sure that the product you are bringing into the U.S. meets the requirements of, 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 of the land. I know I went through this very quick. Hopefully, over time, we can come back and we can begin to break each one of these down. But to limit our, our time to an hour, I think these are the main buckets of what you need to do to bring food into the United States. Again, I always don't take these things for granted. It's always my pleasure to come here and talk about it. So 
Let me take your questions in the next few minutes. So questions, moderator. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And I'm sure everybody must have had a fair share of what is being delivered. Yeah, I noticed some people are asking for the recording. I can't guarantee that now, but I can only guarantee I'll talk to the instructor to see if we can have the material to be sent to your mail. But for the recording, I cannot say yes or no for now. But it's obvious with time, you can find it on our website, but not in the next a week or two. So that's one. Number two, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Oladumoye is standing in for the Vice President 2 of the Institute. Uh, that's Professor Alaka. So after the question and answer, she will have like uh, two minutes to give us a brief from Nigerian Studio of Food Science and Tech. So she should be prepared. So if you have any question, please ask now uh, so that we can all be on the same page and be sure we actually learned something. Thank you. Uh, I learned it is compulsory to have a US agent for the registration. It's not compulsory, you can do it by yourself. But the reason you might need an agent is because of the customs and the taxation and the things like that. But it's not control. You, I'll walk you throughout the registration in two minutes. So you, you really do not need an agent to do your registration. But you need the agent because of the custom regulations, the taxes, and the fees and trade alliances and things like that. That is more of what you need the agent for. But typically, the registration you could do by yourself. It costs you nothing. If you have all the documents, you need to upload your food safety plan, your prerequisite programs, your OPRPs, your PRPs. All those things that you need to, to include. It's something you can do by yourself. For someone that wants to export raw foods like palm oil and gari, do I need to go through? Yes. Like we said, if you're going to bring any food product that is uh, both for human and animal food into the U.S., yes, you have to go through all these requirements. Any product that is going to be into commercial uh for into commerce, yes, you have to have uh these rec follow these re requirements. Good. The FDA registration can it be used for multiple food? Yes. When you get to registration, it's going to ask you how many types of food do you want to export. And like I explained, you have to start ticking each one that you want to export and click each category. So yes, you have to cut. You have your registration has to include the specific products that you are bringing in. I This presentation is just specific to food product, human and animal food. I do not know about prints and fashion and shoes and bags. This is just specific to human and animal food. Any other question? Again, it's always my pleasure to come here and present. I've, I hope Dr. you've learned Doc. one or two things. Doc. Yes, go ahead. Let's add Sorry. a few more. No, no, it's not a question, Doc. Um, just a, a rider to what you have earlier said, and uh, somebody also asked the same question on the chat box. Is that uh, somebody asked if NAVDAC, um, if uh, NAVDAC requirement is necessary? I want to say that yes, you must also have um, must also meet all the regulatory requirements from even the country of origin. Yes, that's that's very critical. So also, your palm oil, gary, whatever it is, must also meet um, regulatory requirements. You must have uh, a minimum of at least a, an export certificate or a health certificate from uh, NAFDAQ before you can even be allowed to ship out any of your food products. So I just thought to put that in the bucket. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you. So thank you. It's been my pleasure to have anchored this again. I hope our, prats, uh, our, our part will cross again. I've seen several known faces here. I just want to call out anybody, but uh, my friends in the house, I, I say thank you. So hopefully we'll meet again. Thank you. Mr. Wally, you can take over. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Ladumoye, can you quickly give us uh, a remark from uh, Professor Alaka before we call it a day? Uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Good evening. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very sure that all of us have enjoyed Dr. Odubemi. He has really wowed all of us. So we we need to give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. If there's an E, applause. In fact, you can see that on the platform, on the different chats. I want to apologize for this coming late because it's supposed to have come first. But unfortunately, I bring you good news from Professor Alaka. It's unavoidably absent. He has been one of those that has been circulating the flyer all over all news platform so that people that are interested in this topic will actually make themselves available. And I'm happy that at least, even online, we have about 60 participants, which is enormous. So Dr. Odukbemi, thank you so much. I'm sure NIFS is home to you and uh, we appreciate you. The Nigerian Institute of Science and Technology is actually the umbrella body that oversees and helps food and allied product companies in Nigeria, West Africa. We are always delighted to have people like you to speak to us on thematic areas of interest, and we are not disappointed. Thank you very much, Dr. Odubemi, for coming to, to speak to us. It's not only NIFSA that are here. We circulated the flyer all over our platforms, and those that are not even in members of NIFS have also benefited from this from this seminar, this training. Thank you so much. On behalf of uh, Professor Alaka of NIFS, the VP2, I say thank you. And I say to also thank you to all the people who have uh, attended this training. Food Update Consult is at home for NIFS. We are, we are together. So we also thank you very much for deeming it fit to team up and collaborate with NIFS to anchor this important program. Many of us uh, who have products, so you have spoken to us and uh, we have gained a lot from you. So thank you so much. On behalf of uh, NIFST and Professor Alaka, I say thank you to everybody. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Oladumoye. Uh, she has spoken on behalf of the STC chairman. And I want to say thank you to everyone that is present as well. From the Food Update Consult, after uh, due consultative time with other partners, they let me know that if you are interested in probably obtaining a certificate for this class, which will have in total package the presentation and likelihood of the video, the recording, it's just a token of 5,000. So you can meet with uh, Mrs. Taiwo Ajagbe Ron and discuss with her if you are interested in the certificate and the materials. So she will definitely know what to do and I will go about it. So thank you so much for taking time out to attend the class. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to a more robust relationship between you, our partners, our stakeholders, our shareholders, and our friends. Thank you. I wish us all a beautiful night and a great rest of the week. Bye. But if you still have any questions, you can always talk to us on foodupdateconsult at gmail.com or send me a WhatsApp message. Please, WhatsApp message on 08055 WhatsApp message, please. Thank you. In the absence of any question, I think we, we can call it a day. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Kikelamo.
you are highly, you are highly welcome. We appreciate your presence. Ah, my darling friend, Maggie Warren, you are there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wally Adegu.